goodness, folks, I didn't know if I was going to be able to join you tonight or not. Um, I, the, my computer just went through a whole series of updates, and um, it was starting to look like maybe one of those updates wasn't so Zoom friendly, but uh, we made it. Here we are. Thank you for your patience, and happy Tuesday. Um, as I mentioned in the email, we have a lot to get caught up on since we were we were off last week. Um, and um, before we launch into um, our slides for this week, I have to show you um, a bit of late breaking show and tell news. Um, I actually just picked these up on my walk home from work tonight. Uh, it is the season. Um, some of you are very aware of this. In fact, some of you are very good. Um, and have your own uh, secret, uh, oh boy, I can see we're gonna have um, some uh, interest here from uh, the peanut gallery. Boker, why don't you move? Uh, it is morel season. Um, I was fortunate enough to get an offer from uh, a local family. They had some very good luck uh, at uh, a property that they own over in Iowa. And they brought back a huge bag. I don't know what it is about morels this year, but but they are huge. I don't know if that's because of the um, uh, the, the the temperature sequence that we've been having, the weather sequence that we've been having. We got rain at the right time. I don't know, but um, you know, I had found. Um, I don't even know if I mentioned this to you guys. About a month ago, I was downstate. And I found uh, a few that were just starting to come up. They were maybe, I don't know, two, three inches, which to me seemed like almost normal, maybe just a little undersized. But this, my goodness, look at this. Um, morels, you know, there's there's a few mushrooms that are, are distinctive, that there's really nothing that uh, looks like it. Uh, there is a mushroom called a false morel, but to me, it doesn't look at all like a true morel, uh, the the top of it, the 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 where the, the spores are produced, um, looks kind of coiled around like a brain. Whereas this has really distinctive um, pits. In fact, the times I've I've tried to go morel hunting, I'll be the first to admit I'm not very good at it. Um, my eye is always tricked and drawn to um, walnut walnut shells that are chewed open or split open and have that uh, sort of pitted pattern on the inside too. But um, one other thing to, to always check, even if, if you do have some doubt as to what you found, um, you can always look, I'm gonna do a little dissection here. These are, by the way, um, they're not long for this world. As soon as we finish tonight, I'm heading for the saute pan because I can't resist. Um, morels are hollow. They have a hollow stem. Some other mushrooms um, that, again, I can't uh, offhand think of one that that might look like this, but um, they they say the false morels. In fact, some people even say false morels, if you cook them right, are are not toxic. Uh, but they, they have a, a filled in stem, whereas these guys have a hollow stem. There's actually three in this bag, three monsters here um, that uh, huh, are gonna make a nice little snack here at Casa Auto, provided they don't get eaten by uh, the furry roommates before we're done. Um, we'll put that aside. And yeah, we, we took last week off. It will probably continue that pattern again through the summertime. Um, there's a few things um, that I need to go see and go do on Tuesday nights. And um, uh, that also brings up the subject of getting the dates loaded up. Um, that's something I don't have the, the skills or the, uh, the clearance to do. So I'll work with our marketing department on that so we can get our uh, June, July, and August dates um, set up. But we'll keep on going with our uh, Tuesday night, 8 p.m. time slot. Um, and because the nature just doesn't stop. Now, uh, let me see here uh, if I can get our slides pulled up for this week. Um, and it, uh, let's see. 
boy, you know, it's been just long enough. <laughs> having two, you know, having a week off here, I have to find the right screens. There we go. All right, we're going to share that screen. And we're going to pull up our slides. All right, I'm going to apologize right off the bat for this first one. What do we got here? Um, oh, we're not editing it. Let's start here. So this is the scene that has greeted me for the last few mornings. Um, this is the bird bath in the backyard. In fact, um, I think I'm going to change it again tonight before I go to bed. So um, you think, my goodness, man, what kind of dirty birds are in your neighborhood? This is a sign that there are nesting robins nearby. Um, we've we've had you know fair amounts of rain. We had a really nice rain last uh, last Friday, so it's not like we're in the drought conditions. But the water does um, disappear pretty quickly, and and robins need mud in order to uh, anchor to to construct their nest and to anchor it to um, gosh more and more. It's it's some part of a house somewhere, a, a post on a porch or a downspout somewhere. Uh, they do still also nest in trees from time to time, but they need to make mud. And in order to make mud, they need to add water to the soil that they've gathered. So um, this has been uh, fairly constant now for the last couple of days. And it's just a clue that there's a nesting robins nearby. So if you keep a bird bath as well and you're struggling with the same thing, it's not that the birds are getting really dirty, it's just they're, um, they're in the process of building their nests. Mm -hmm. um, so speaking of nesting birds, you might be able to see what's going on here. This is a uh, hole 15 at uh, Riverview Mini Golf, which is over at Pottawatomie Park. And uh, Hole 15 caused quite a stir in the parks and the recreation departments over the last few weeks. Um, there's uh, right in the middle here, there is a nesting goose. Um, it's actually, it's a great spot. Um, she's pretty well protected from uh, from predators. We do get the occasional skunk or raccoon that wanders through mini golf, but it's so um, structured in there. There's uh, there's many signs of human presence and the uh, getting ready for uh, the golf course, the mini golf course to open. There's been a lot of activity there with our, our parks crew. So um, that usually, wildlife that isn't used to being around people will shy away from situations like that so um mama goose set up shop there on hole 15 the uh, mini golf manager was a little concerned because uh, unlike the pools that don't open until memorial day weekend mini golf opened last weekend and um we were at a, a staff meeting uh, last thursday and uh, the manager was expressing some concern. Um, uh, well, actually, I take that back. The, the uh, mini golf actually opened the week before. So she uh, had expressed concern about having people on the course with a goose. Canada geese are, are pretty uh, well known for their defensive tactics when they are guarding a nest. Um, they put warning signs up at hole 14. Some people actually opted to skip hole 15 and just let the mom, uh, mother goose have her piece there. But uh, there were uh, no conflicts at all. Um, while she was um, sitting on her eggs, and we can zoom in here. You can see she's nicely nestled in here. This is all, um, I think this is all prairie drop seed that she's nestled herself within. Um, takes a uh, four weeks, 28 days to um, create baby geese. While she was sitting there, uh, dad was just slightly offshore. Um, he was not the super attentive fa father goose that we sometimes see. He was uh, content. I, I think he really felt like she was in good hands there. Um, he did come up. I wanted to get a closer picture of her. And in uh, approaching the nest, that did prompt him to come up and uh, just kind of make sure he never, though, he never entered the boundaries of the course. 
Um, so I think he felt like she was um, capable of taking care of herself. Um, she did give me a couple little low hisses. I didn't, I didn't want to uh, get her too riled up, um, but she, she hissed a little bit, but um, she stood up, kind of repositioned herself over her eggs and then um, sat back down again. I believe the goslings hatched on Friday of last week. So yeah, the, the, the course had been open for not quite one week. They had one weekend where there were people on the course with the goose. And then um, the manager was very relieved that uh, the whole little family, I think she had five little ones. Um, they, once they uh, hatched and dried off, then they marched right over there uh, to the river, plopped in and can still be seen hanging out uh, this to the this rail here on the left that is where the uh, the boat rentals are and then you can see up ahead there's the paddle wheel river boats uh, and it's a um, fairly well populated area it's a good spot for uh, this family to hang out now um you might remember last year the uh, the uh, women's locker room at the Potawatomi pool played host to uh, a mallard hen. The staff there, uh, they named her Luna. And that was also kind of a race. Uh, the, the pool's open Memorial Day weekend. Uh, last year, we had, you know, a long, a uh, lot of cool, rainy weather. Um, and that uh, the nest location last year uh, the uh, mallard hen Luna chose a corner that was right underneath the downspot. So it was nice in that she she had a lot of uh, protection from potential predators, but her nest kept getting wet every time it rained. <laughs> um, that nest, so just to give you an idea of the way things are running timing wise um, this year versus last year, um, so the pools open on Memorial Day weekend. There was concern that the ducks, the ducklings were not going to hatch by Memorial Day weekend. And indeed they did not. So I think it was 1500 people came through the pool opening weekend. Um, the staff at the pool put some uh, uh, rope and cones up to protect that corner where Luna was uh, incubating her eggs. Uh, I, she sat there through Memorial Day and the Tuesday. It wasn't until the Wednesday that uh, of that following week that her eggs finally hatched. So we were into June when uh, those eggs hatched. This, um, but which we're, we're assuming it might be Luna back again. She certainly seemed to know her way and feel very comfortable around the pool building. This was round two. These ducklings hatched on May 1st, so a full month earlier. Uh, I've been hearing from uh, a lot of people who do wildlife rescue too, that they were getting um, geese, uh, little goslings, as well as little ducklings well uh, over a month earlier than they have in uh, previous years. So things got an early start. They're probably our, our mild winter may have had something to do with that, but um, uh, right now, Potawatomi has produced, uh, I think it's five goslings, and there are 10 little ducklings here that made the march from the pool. Uh, the staff actually shepherded them up the, uh, the ramp and out the door and then down to the river. So uh, no more ducks in the locker rooms, no more geese on the mini golf course. Things are looking up here <laughs> at uh, Potawatomi. So um, I might I might write about this little duck family um, for as long as I've been watching ducks and and I actually I don't know if I ever told you guys but back when I was in high school um, I did a, a independent study my senior year at, um, I, I truly was interested in ducks but it was also a great way to get to spend every single morning of spring semester senior year sitting in a park <laughs> watching ducks. Um, it was a, for an animal behavior class and um, 
I, I had a, a friend who was uh, observing the geese, which at that time, geese were not very common. There, there was, I think, one, maybe two pairs of uh, Canada geese at this park. Uh, but we would go there every morning and um, take notes on duck behavior. Well, with mallards, um, you know, males will, will court a female, but usually once she is uh, sitting on the nest, he's out of there. And that's why we see these, these groups of bachelor mallards, the mallard drakes hanging out together while the, the females are, uh, they've, they've built the uh, uh, nest and they've laid the eggs and they're incubating the eggs and then they rear the young pretty much on their own. Well, this guy is hanging out uh, with his mate. And I, I don't know, maybe some of you have, have observed this. I never have. I thought it was really interesting. This is, um, um, isn't really even a full blown pond. Uh, this, the hen, let's, if we zoom in here, we can see the hen and the ducklings uh, up on uh, the bank here. See the little ducklings, here's mama. And here's pop uh, hanging out with them. So this was over, um, part of my job, you know, is going out to uh, retirement homes, including a place called Reserve of Geneva, which is a little bit west of Randall Road, local folks, you can probably picture that area by, um, let's see, there's Dogtopia there and Fox Valley Physicians is over there. Well, just north of that physician's building is Really, it's a it's a stormwater collection area. There's a big grate at one end, but it's been planted. There's a lot of nice uh, reeds. There's a lot of nice native plants that surround uh, this this retention area, and um, the uh, the female the the uh, the mama here she had nested in the parking lot at the reserve of Geneva. So that would be um, across the street even uh, from, from where this pond is. She was uh, on an island in the parking lot. I think I might've showed her picture a few weeks ago. Um, the uh, residents and staff there had put some cones up uh, around her nest, uh, some yellow or uh, orange traffic cones. And then there was a, a silver a foil pan with some water in it for her and some little peas in case she got hungry. So she was very uh, much cared about and doted over what, during her time while she was uh, sitting on the eggs in the parking lot. Well, they hatched one morning and uh, one of the residents there was, was so excited. She followed from a distance as the mom walked the ducks because uh, there was concern on the residents part. They, weren't, they didn't even know this water was there. Um, they weren't sure where she was gonna have to walk them. But um, uh, they, uh, walked across the street uh, and have been hanging out in the water. You can see there's lots of nice vegetation here for them to, to take shelter in. Uh, there was also a muskrat that, that kept kind of um, patrolling back and forth here. Um, residents were happy to hear that uh, the muskrat was no threat to the ducks. It's not, uh, they were a little worried, I guess, that the muskrat try, might try to eat the ducks. So I was happy to be able to tell them that the, the muskrat and the ducks can um, coexist uh, pretty peacefully. But uh, again, this behavior was just so interesting. He really seemed as though he was taking a, a full-on parental role in uh, helping to rear his little ducklings. Um, so yeah, kind of cool. Now, uh, some of you, uh, Swedbergs, uh, I think might be familiar with this. This is the rock uh, that is... Um, it's in a retention pond over on uh, Dean Street. And it is, it is, it's just a busy little rock. There are so often turtles sitting on this rock. Well, I wanted to take some pictures for you guys. And I also was curious if I could zoom in enough to see just what kind of turtles uh, inhabit this pond. I suspect they're probably painted turtles, but you never know sometimes something unusual like a, a map turtle or something might show up. Well. Um, I was a good, I don't know, I'm not good with distance, we'll say a uh, hundred feet away or so. And um, I must have moved funny or something. And all the turtles, this, this rock, as I approached it, it was covered in turtles and the turtles all scattered. But 
<laughs> they didn't go very far. If we zoom in here, all these, see all these little heads <laughs> poking up? Here's one, here's one, here's one, here, here, here. Um, they all left the rock, but they didn't go far. Um, it was it was really kind of cute. And I felt bad because this was a day, uh, when was this? It was, it's actually fairly warm out that day, but these are turtles. They've they spent the winter down in the mud of this pond and they, they really need to get up and bass. They need to warm their bodies. Um, they need to uh, restore uh, the, the, the vitamin D and the calcium that they may have lost over the winter time. And um, from that far away, I, I did something that, that spooked them and they all hopped off. Well, there's one over here too. Yeah, they were just, there was just a ton of turtles and they all jumped off and swam just a short distance away. I did stick around long enough to see um, that they were slowly making their way back to the pond, uh, to the rock. Here's one hauling itself up here. Um, and that, that does uh, look like a painted turtle. The yellow markings here on the neck seem to indicate painted turtle. Well, um, I went back another day to see if I could do any better. And um, it, was a, it was a cooler day. It was a cloudy day. This was, um, this was on Saturday. And, and as the uh, afternoon went on, the, the breeze picked up and the temperature dropped. But there were still uh, four turtles on the rock when I got there. I, I've seen cormorants on this rock. I've seen herons on this rock. It is really a busy rock. It's really the only rock in this pond. Um, so it's a, it's a great place if you're in the area. Uh, it's it's um, Dean Street, just a little bit east of Randall Road. Uh, it's really, and if you approach quietly, you can actually get quite a show there. If you wave your arms around a little bit, like I apparently did, you're gonna have to wait <laughs> until they slowly come back. But yeah, these are all looking like painted turtles. You know, see how this one here, I, this was zoomed in quite a bit on my, my phone camera. So not great quality image at all, but you could still see the outline here of the head out and then the, the feet out as well. I've been told, I have not found uh, confirmation of this in any references, but different people have told me that turtles will adopt this posture when they're basking because it helps dry off or dry out um, things like uh, leeches that might be uh, stuck on their skin. The leeches don't, um, don't like to be exposed to the sunlight, so they are apt to let go and dry off. I, I don't know um, if that's the case, but I've seen leeches on turtles. They seem pretty, pretty stuck on there. Um, and if they're feeding, I wouldn't think they'd want to give up a, a, a good food source like that just because they were getting uh, a little dry. I don't know that they would dry out that quickly because the turtle's body would retain some moisture too. Anyway, something I've always heard, and you will see it sometimes, sometimes the turtle is just resting on its plaster and all four limbs are, are out, almost like it's, you know, sailing through the air and pretending like it is. But a busy rock um, in a pond that must be just loaded with painted turtles. Let's see, what else do we have coming up here? Oh, so um, a couple of weeks ago, um, this is our, our King County Certified Naturalist. This is our, our current crop of uh, KCCNers, as we call them. They are uh, progressing now. They finished their uh, six weeks of uh, evening lecture classes, and we're now into uh, our field trips. This is the second of four, four field trips that this uh, class will attend. This was uh, wetland, I'm sorry, woodland ecology at Johnson's Mound. Um, the date of the first Saturday in May coincided with the uh, uh, annual spring bird count that uh, our, well, actually not just our local chapter of Audubon, but Audubon chapters throughout the country participate in. Uh, there's over 40 years of data now that uh, King County Audubon has gathered about the bird populations in this area. Um, and this was um, 
uh, one of the birders was coming through. She was asking if we had by chance uh, seen or heard any barred owls. That was an owl they were hoping to get um, at Johnson's Mound. It was a great day. There were so many uh, little warblers in the trees. Um, it was really a, a good day to be out. In fact, you can see there was a little bit of rain um, coming down, nothing um, to deter uh, hardcore nature lovers like this, but um, it was just, it's, it was one of those magical spring days when it just seemed like so many things were going on in the woods. Um, the focus of uh, this particular field trip I mentioned was woodland ecology. So we were talking a lot about uh, the plant communities in a woodland area. And woodlands, we use that term as opposed to forest, um, just because a forest, um, when, we, when we talk about a forest community, we're talking about um, an area where there's a, the tree, the canopy cover is very dense. There's very little light that reaches the, the floor, forest floor. In a woodland, the canopy, the trees are a little bit more widely spaced. They let a little bit more light in. Uh, and then uh, we also have savannas, which actually are, are pretty rare around here, but savannas have very widely spaced trees, something like um, uh, there's 70% of the available light reaches the, uh, the floor in uh, areas like that. Um, so you can sort of see here um, alongside Johnson's Mound has this uh, nice paved road that goes up and around for um, like I was surprised a number of times we had to step aside as uh, cars drove through, uh, taking in the uh, the wildflowers that are all along uh, the road here. Um, you can kind of see up here what the real showstopper was as we were we were talking about trees. In fact, we had stopped at this particular point. Um, just off camera here was a uh, a basswood tree, and we were comparing. Uh, we were talking about you know how you identify a basswood by the the heart shaped leaves, and uh, we talked a little bit about how the uh, the inner bark is very fibrous and can be used uh, has historically been used to make uh, cordage. Um, we were talking about what the fruit um, what the, the flowers smell like and what the fruit looks like. Well. Then all of a sudden the instructors, we all notice that nobody is listening because everybody is looking up because a scarlet tanager flew in. So here he is again, not a great picture. I was using my cell phone to zoom in, but um, he uh, put on quite a show. It did not seem all that, uh, that shy, even though there were quite a few people in the area. He was picking, cleaning uh, insects um, from the, the leaves up there. His mate, was there as well, or I don't know if it was his mate, it was a, a female. Usually uh, when there's a male and a female and they're migrating together, they often are connected. Um, they are a pair, but um, she, she is uh, in contrast to his uh, deep scarlet and black wings, she's um, kind of the color of these early spring leaves. She's a, you know, a, a olive-ish, yellowish, greenish color. Um, and it was it was much more difficult to spot her, but um, she was pecking away at different leaves and you could see by the way the leaves are moving where she was moving. So that was uh, definitely another highlight as we made our way around the mound. Uh, and then of course, uh, we got to the station where we were looking at uh, not what's up in the trees, but what's underneath them, what's down on the ground. Um, and this is something I love to look for. There's there's a uh, few things I always uh, try to track down when I'm at Johnson's Mountain. This is one of them. This is our American millipede. Um, now it's in a defensive posture here. There were a lot of people that wanted to see this millipede and it decided that it just wasn't uh, feeling safe. Um, their their under, uh, undercarriage is soft. Um, this is a posture that they will adapt when they are protecting that, that soft underbelly. And they put the uh, their exoskeleton here, uh, guards them from uh, any harm. Let's zoom in here. They're just 
really, really cool insects. Look at all of these legs. Now, um, what you can't see uh, from this particular position is that millipedes have two pairs of legs per body segment, as opposed to uh, the centipede, which has one pair of legs per segment. But I just thought this almost looks like a nautilus, doesn't it? The way it's coiled. And then the legs are folded like this. Super cool. Um, these millipedes don't seem to like areas that have had a lot of disturbance. It's not really something we run into in neighborhoods. In fact, a lot of the millipedes we see around our, our homes and our basements, um, greenhouses. In fact, some of the millipedes are called greenhouse millipedes. A, a lot of those have been uh, shipped around the world. They, they move around in um, plant material and nursery stock uh, from other countries. But this is the true 100% uh, bona fide American millipede. Now this, these are also native, um, but a different, uh, different group entirely. These are, um, I don't know if, if there's a, a specific, is that gonna be redundant if I say a specific common name? Uh, for this particular millipede. They're part of a group of millipedes known as the cyanide millipedes. So um, they will coil up as well um, when they feel threatened. But in addition to that, um, they, their defensive chemical, which the American millipede has a defensive chemical too, but with these cyanide millipedes, it smells like amaretto. It's got that almondy, um, uh, liqueur sent to it. Um, we didn't mess with these guys too much um, because everybody wanted to photograph them with their legs out like this. Um, there's a species, um, I'm not a millipede expert, um, and sometimes there's there's parts that you need to look at that you need a magnifying glass for, but I, just in, in reading about what is common in Northeastern Illinois, it sounds, it, it seems as though this could be a species called Pleuroloma flavipes. Big deal, right? Um, the, the way you can tell uh, what you look for to see if, if uh, that's it or if it might be something else. You see how um, the yellow here, which is probably a warning coloration to predators to, to just leave it alone. Um, see how it makes these wedge shaped uh, kind of like triangles above the legs. Um, this is another uh, another thing I'd love to look for. It, it, they're, they're pretty common throughout Johnson's Mound. Um, just, uh, if you move some, uh, fallen branches or bark, push things around. We always stress though, if you do that to make sure you put it back when you're done. Oh, look at this. I think, <laughs> I didn't even notice this. We were also excited about the millipede. I didn't see there's a slug photobomb here in the back. How cool is that? This, you know, I, I, the, the, the name of this type of slug is escaping me, but they're the, the ones that are the, they're the thicker larger slugs that we have in this area. And oftentimes they take on an orangish color. They have a, a really thick mucus that they produce that is uh, being studied by uh, the medical community because it seems like it might have a potential to be used as a, um, a suture type glue. It's because it's that sticky, it can help hold wounds together. Anyway, I didn't even see that there till just now. Um, but if we pull out again here and we look at our millipede, we can double check and sure enough, two pairs of legs per body segment. So um, another super, super cool thing. Uh, these guys are uh, detritivores. Uh, so a, a centipede, again, compare and contrast. A lot of times we tend to mix up our millipedes and our centipedes, but centipedes are predators and they, um, they're, um, uh, first pair of uh, legs that are, uh, they're modified into uh, fangs that inject venom. These guys, uh, the millipedes, though, they are um, 
more specialized in feeding on the leaf litter and things like that, things that you would find underneath uh, the logs. Now here, you know, I'm going to move this bar out of the way because I learned we could do that. Um, look what I found. So this was just another night at Casa Auto. This was last week. Um, I found this little guy while I was getting ready to do a load of laundry. You know that that cup that's in the, the middle of the agitator and um, uh, the older style washing machines? Um, I think it's for the uh, fabric softener, um, liquid fabric softener. Well, I always have to run my finger around in that because there's always dog hair because of the furry roommates. Well, I was just about to do that. And I noticed that the, the little bits of dog hair that were in there were moving. And I looked and here, this is the first time I have ever found a living pseudo scorpion. Um, I found a couple of dead ones over the years, but um, this one was very much alive. Now, just to give you a sense of the size, so this is, um, I, I uh, was trying to, to figure out how I could take a picture of it. I got a little, um, a plastic cup, and that's the lettering at the bottom of the plastic cup. Um, if I had a, a toothpick, I... I really needed like a third hand um, to to be able to to give you guys a sense of scale, and I, I just didn't have one. Um, my lip balm didn't fit in the plastic cup. This was a small cup, um, but this was trust me. This was a really tiny little creature. Um, with any luck at all, when we go to the next slide here, this is a video. Let's see if I can get it to to play here. Um, hmm. um, the way this thing moved around in the cup, it was like, it was moving like a, a skid steer, you know, it had, it had a zero turn ratio, um, and it was, it was zipping around. It was so cool. I see we've got the spinny circle here. This might take a minute to load. Um, here we go. Maybe. Um, but the, so the, these guys, pseudoscorpions are, um, they're arachnids. Uh, they are not, as the name indicates, they are not true scorpions. Um, they are part of, um, the good guys. They're, they are, um, sometimes called the librarian's, uh, friend because they feed on book lice. Now, um, I don't have any books in my laundry room, but um, it is a, a somewhat damp environment. The, the wash machine is there, the um, washing tubs are there. And so I, I actually, after I finished taking pictures in this video that I'm hoping is gonna load here, um, I, I, I really thought long and hard before I let it go because once I finished with the laundry, I was going to be running the dryer. And the last thing I'd want to do is, is release it somewhere where it was going to get overheated and, um, you know, not survive. So um, I, I hope I did the right thing, but I put it back in the, uh, the fabric softener cup and then I let it decide where it was, uh, where it wanted to move to. Um, don't know if I'll ever see it again because it was, and it was super tiny, but uh, it was, Boy, it was a highlight, and now you're not able to see it. Um, I'm wondering if this would play better if I downloaded it. Um, we might try that because this is just making everybody dizzy. If we have, uh, if I remember at the end, that's what we'll we'll do. Um, all right, this is just a, a brief little rant. What were we just talking about? But um, bird migrations. Um, Something that's very important to birds migrating at night is dark skies. In fact, March, I'm sorry, May 13th, this past weekend, Saturday night, was um, International Migratory Bird Day, World Migratory Bird Day, I think is the official name. And uh, it's, a, it's a worldwide effort to get people to uh, pay attention to the migrating birds around them. The, 
vast majority of migrations take place at night. It's easier for birds to fly when um, the winds are generally lower and the um, uh, risk of predation is less. Uh, the sun is gone. They've got the moon and the stars to navigate by, but then people mess it up by putting up a lot of bright lights. So um, last uh, Saturday night, the city of St. Charles did turn off the, uh, the lights on the iconic tower down at the municipal building uh, in uh, honor of World Migratory Bird Day. Thank you, Susie, for arranging for that. Um, <clears throat> well, look what's going on on the other side of town. This is a circus that is in town. And they have what is, I guess, I don't know if it's the largest circus tent ever, but it's, it's this huge tent um, on the fairgrounds property. And it is all lit up. Not only has it got bright lights, I mean, look at the glow around this thing. When I left Hickory Nose, this was 10 to 11 on um, either Thursday or Friday night of last week. And, um, Sorry, <laughs> three roommates here are having a little skirmish. There we go. This one's just going to come up with me. Um, so when I left Hickory Knolls, I saw this glow and I thought, well, maybe there's something going on at the Geneva High School football field because I'm not a good judge of distance. I thought, you know, maybe it was, this was in the same general direction. Well, it turns out there's a fairgrounds and it's this huge tent. <laughs> Um, I don't know how much longer the uh, circus is in town for, um, and I don't know. I don't know if there if there's even any ordinance that would prevent something like this, but it's definitely something I'm checking into. And uh, with any luck at all, we can prevent uh, conflicts like this during uh, either fall migration or uh, if the circus comes back uh, for spring migration of next year. Anyway, it, it, it's actually not, even though World Mig uh, Migratory Bird Day is over, it's not a bad idea to turn your lights off even now. Um, mine are set to go off They're on a motion detector, but um, they are set to just turn off at, at 10 o'clock, um, which is good. A lot of migrations happen 10 o'clock and later. Um, but yeah, if you can flip your lights off, make life a lot easier for our migratory birds. Uh, this was just a little visitor I found. Um, I didn't have time to, to key it out. It's a little jumping spider that um, we zoom in. I just think these guys are the cutest things. You may have, uh, I think I've said it before. They look like little teddy bears, don't they? Um, they are predators. They don't, um, they're ambush predators. They don't spin a web. They, they can spin. Like this one did uh, let a pretty good line of silk go as I was moving it. Um, so it's not that they can't produce silk, but they don't spin silk to capture their prey. They jump, hence the name jumping spider. But look at this face, those eyes. They have, um, they have eight eyes, but they've got two large ones there that are meant, uh, that are used for detecting motion. And uh, I just think they're the cutest things. Um, lots and lots of jumping spider activity now that things are warming up. Um, keep your eyes open, you might have one of your own. Um, so this, this is the picture I was thinking was gonna come after our uh, millipedes at Johnson's Mountain. This is a centipede. So I found this, and this is a tiny one. This is a house centipede. So these are those things, they, they look like they've got a gazillion legs and they look like they're running a gazillion miles an hour. They run very fast. People, uh, even when they're used to them, sometimes they kind of get startled. This one was so tiny though. Um, it, it's a baby, so it must mean that I've got a, a mama and a daddy centipede somewhere in the house here. But this was, I was moving a plant outdoors. Uh, the other day, and I, I actually thought this was a, a piece of fuzz, and it was sort of early in the morning, and my brain hadn't really, you know, 
wasn't fully functional yet. The coffee hadn't kicked in. I was thinking, why is this piece of fuzz circling? I was I was thinking, why is there like a, a circular wind in the house that's making this piece of fuzz go around? This is the, the saucer that was underneath the plant. But um, it's a it's a little tiny house centipede. It was less than an inch long. Um, if we zoom in here, so we can see our body segments here. And then we can see one pair of legs on each segment. Um, just like with the pseudoscorpion, um, th these are, are good guys as well. They, uh, they thrive in, in moist areas. So the saucer of a, a house plant is a good spot for it to be. And they, um, they also feed on things that you really don't wanna have around your house. Things like uh, silverfish, um, soft bodied insects like that. I would imagine maybe there was something uh, living on this plant that it might have uh, decided was making a good food source. But anyway, I, I, um, before I took the plant saucer outside, I made sure to release the house centipede here inside where it could continue to do its hard work. Now, Jerry, I have to apologize. I owe you an email. I wanted to, um, Jerry had emailed some um, uh, pictures from uh, Spring Bird Count Day. Um, I did not get, uh, there's a, 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 Terry Measley is our local bee guy and I was going to email him your uh, bee videos and I just didn't get a chance to do that. Um, I thought this was kind of cool. I love these. I have uh, a red cedar, three red cedars here in my yard. And I, I look for these two. They're, they're, um, they're called cedar apple rust. Um, this is one of a whole group of uh, fungi that rely, they, they have, um, they need two different hosts. And in this case, it's a cedar <laughs> and an apple tree. Uh, on the apple tree, uh, they don't, the growth doesn't, um, have this 3D nature to it. It's more of an orange spot on the leaf, but uh, this, this can't occur unless an area has both the host plants. So um, the apple tree, and it, it doesn't really matter what kind of apple tree, it could be a crab apple tree or um, the kinds of apples that we uh, you know, grow to eat to make applesauce out of and apple pies and things like that. But um, this is, I think this is the drying phase. There's another phase where it's, it's like these um, tentacle-like things. And gosh, they have a name that is escaping me at the moment. Um, right before it took this form, there was another form where those uh, tentacles were, were soft um, and kind of an orangish, they were thicker and a, a jelly had a jelly-like consistency to them. Now they're drying out, but the spores are spreading. Uh, they're traveling over to the uh, apple tree. I think there might even be some insect involvement in this too. It's a really fascinating uh, relationship between these, these two very different types of trees and uh, this fungus that needs them both in order to survive. I may have... Um, I think we might have talked about these a, a couple of years ago. Whenever I see this um, this uh, fungus in this shape, it always makes me think of this kid from the Rugrats. I, I don't remember what his name was, but uh, the way his hair grows all spiky and everything, he's got uh, cedar apple fungus <laughs> all over his head. Well, if you're a nature nerd, that's what you see. <laughs> um, one more quick thing. No, two more quick things. Wild hyacinth are in bloom. Uh, this, I took this picture on Friday over at Mount St. Mary's Park. Mount St. Mary's, um, it's a, a community park. It's got a lot of turf grass. It's got a lot of uh, cultivated things. That's where the big uh, daffodil display is. Um, but along the, the eastern border of the park between the, the uh, walking paths and the Fox River is this naturalized border. And um, there are hyacinths uh, throughout the area. Um, this is a plant, it, it does grow from, uh, from bulbs, but those bulbs are formed uh, from seeds. 
And uh, now it was raining the day I took this picture. Uh, so there wasn't a lot of um, uh, activity on the water, but it was, they, they, they're not growing in, um, in big groups and big clumps. They were scattered throughout the area. But look at, look at the detail on these plants. I, I vowed when I saw this that I was going to have to add some wild hyacinths um, to the yard here. They were just really, really cool looking. They're growing amongst some uh, golden Alexanders and um, the uh, yellow of those umbels really highlighted the um, centers of our hyacinth. Super cool. And then, all right, so uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we made the trip down to uh, WGN to talk about the plight of uh, birds of prey and landfills and birds getting scorched by those flames. Uh, we'd written a two-part column about Icarus, the young red-tailed hawk that got uh, pretty badly burned. Its feathers definitely are uh, gonna take another year or so to grow back uh, from those landfill flames. But anyway, this is, um, Lillier, who is uh, the John the falconer that we worked with on that story, this is his bird that he hunts with. And um, we took her to the studio. Uh, Icarus isn't as, uh, since it's a, a bird that is going to be released, it's not allowed to be put on display. So uh, this was the, the bird that we used to, to talk about the injuries that Icarus uh, sustained. But anyway, afterwards, um, I get to put on the glove and actually uh, hold Lillie. Um, I wanted to try and take a selfie and I'm not, I'm not real good when it comes to taking selfies, but it just cracked me up because she could see herself in the screen of my phone. And <laughs> I was just giving it this look, like who's that little bird? And <laughs> every time I tried to take a picture, she would get this, this this look on her face. Um, so now I kind of want to do it again because it was a, a whole lot of fun. Um, and it, it didn't really disturb her then. I was afraid that, you know, she might, you know, crush my phone or, you know, crush my hand, uh, bite my face. I don't know. She's a bird of prey, but um, just a little bit of fun that uh, can be had if you happen to find yourself with a bird of prey on your arm. Okay, with that, uh, let's stop or share. Um, we'll come back here. looks like we've got a fair amount of uh, chats to get through here. Um, uh, Stinkhorn, nope, um, um, Morel. Um, and uh, see you tomorrow. Okay, I'm not sure, Meredith, what we were talking about there. I'm so bad at keeping up on these while we're going through. Um, <clears throat> oh, hey, Susie, are you having an orange? <laughs> yes, and it just didn't cut it once you got that morel in there. Aren't these, aren't these the biggest morels you've ever seen? I just, they're, they're beautiful. I can't, I'm coming over in a few minutes. <laughs> I'm <just> kidding. <laughs> Here's another one. <laughs> oh, wow. there's three. <laughs> mm. Yeah, and it's funny, I, I've got to keep my eye on them because Foker's. Every time I open the bag up, he comes over here. I think he thinks they smell pretty good. <laughs> um, oh, Greg and Kelly. All right, so you've got a rock update. In the past week, we have seen probably a dozen baby turtles uh, on the Dean Street Rock <laughs> pending. <laughs> um, yes, it is also a good rock for seeing cormorants. I, I, I really have to be careful driving through that area. There's, there's, I, the last thing I want to be is a distracted driver, but there is always something to look at on that rock. It's, it's, it's even halfway warm out. Uh, things are always crawling up on that rock uh, to bask or hunt or whatever. Um, and uh, Greg and Kelly, I didn't realize that you live next door to Michelle. Um, I was walking by there the other day. I, I met a friend over at Riverlands and she waved me down. We had a little nature nerdy conversation. That's super cool. Um, yeah, it's, it's nice uh, co catching up with her on, on all of your presentations. <laughs> well, is that, um, is that how we, is that how Michelle ended up 
in KCCN? Was that because of you guys? Um, yep. <laughs> thank <was>. you. <laughs> Spread the good word. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, turtles, I think turtles do uh, have great eyesight. Uh, I, I, I think too, Jerry, I, cause I used to think it was vibrations. You know, if I was sneaking up on a turtle and, and you know, all of a sudden they disappeared, but there was no way they could have felt that vibe because I was, I was nowhere near these guys uh, and they just all got spooked um, and dove into the, uh, the water. Um, yeah, so besides, yes, besides our bright lights, we've also got fireworks going off. Um, I think there's, um, I don't know, I guess we just have more work to do in terms of making people more aware of what's going on around them. Huh? Less my neighbors, they turned theirs off. And, it, and he had a hard time because it's all, you know, done by the um, landscapers and stuff, but he was out there working on it and got them off for that night, and they turned them back on the next night. But that's okay. No, well, for one night, baby steps, right? <laughs> yeah, baby steps. That's true. Um, well, and um, I can't remember. Did we talk about birdcast.info? Um, sometimes I get this program confused with the other outreach that we're doing, but. Um, that is a phenomenal website uh, put out by the um, same people. It's it's Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So the same people that have uh, like Backyard Bird Count and um, the All About Birds website. Uh, they worked with uh, Amherst and I think the University of Colorado, but birdcast.info, uh, you can go there and it shows a map of the United States and it's colored um, just like you'd see on a weather map where the activity is, the lighter the color, the more bird activity. Uh, and then you can type in your location. I put in Kane County. Um, I think it was on uh, Migratory Bird Day. It was, it was sometime in the last couple of days. They uh, were predicting 4 million birds flying over King County that night. Um, on the, the uh, map of the United States, they, they give you uh, estimates of how many millions of birds are predicted uh, nationwide, but it's, it's really cool. And then they also break it down into what species you can expect to see in your area. So that's, uh, that might be worth checking out too, birdcast.info. Oh, Jerry, your nighthawks are back. Oh, that's cool. Um, don't they sound like like woodcocks? I always uh, think that's so cool how it's the same like eh, sound. Um, I'll have to listen. I always hear them. Um, I, you know, I was gonna do. Uh, we we don't have nighthawks here in uh, in my neighborhood where I live, but there are a lot of. Um, did I say woodcocks? I meant nighthawks. Um, there are a lot of nighthawks that forage in downtown St. Charles. There's either a lot or there's a couple that are very vocal, but um, they um, oftentimes when I, I do good natured from the porch at uh, world headquarters there, I can hear them zooming and, and feeding up in the air. So I'll have to give a listen the next time I'm down there. I, I was gonna do it outside tonight, but it cold out all of a sudden. It got breezy and, and chilly. So I went out and I came in. Um, uh, Chucky, yes, thank you. That's the yeah, that's the character from uh, uh, Rugrats. Thank you for that, Meredith. Um, uh, oh, stink corn is crenellation similar to morel, but stink, uh, or maybe I'm dreaming. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, there's, there's, uh, stink horns can take on different, there's a few different kinds. Um, I'm trying to think of, of when they appear. Um, but morel is another thing that helps with uh, their identification is the timing of things. They are very much a spring um, mushroom um, as we get into some in fact, somebody showed me a picture of a chicken of the woods, which I thought seemed kind of early. Those are those uh, gorgeous uh, orangish colored mushrooms that grow in a, a sort of a, a roughly shelf 
type of pattern. I didn't think it was quite time for those yet, but apparently they're out there as well. And then as we go through the season, once we get into late summer and fall, then we've got our um, puffballs in our hen of the woods. And that's pretty much it for mushrooms. I feel confident in identifying and eating. <laughs> we'll cover that again another time as more mushrooms come up. Um, and yes, the next stage of cedar apple rust is the gall. Um, yeah, it's, um, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of uh, fungi where they, they require um, two different plants in order to complete their life cycle. Uh, and how these things work out is just, just mind blowing and super cool too. Um, folks, I think that's, is that, oh, no, hold on, there's one more. Hey, Di. Uh, through the six uh, tanager this week too, I learned that because I hang out in the canopy there, not observe that often. That's true. And I, I want to say that they are um, a species that requires a fairly thick uh, or deep woods in order to nest. Um, they're not ones that uh, will, um, will set up housekeeping in a, in a, say, a savanna type of community or even uh, when they, they really like to have some some thick woods around them in order to uh, to make their nests. Um, but yeah, great to have them back. And I know there are some that do nest in Kane County. So keep your eyes out. You might see or hear them again this uh, this summer. All right, folks. Um, well, we started late and we're ending late. <laughs> um, but uh, we, we got through. I think we're caught up now. Um, another week of good nature. We will be back again next week, and I will talk to marketing about getting our summer dates uh, put up so uh, you can register for more fun in the future. All right. All right, everybody. Have a great rest of your week. Um, see you again soon. Thank Thanks, you, Pam. Pam. Take care. Thanks, Pam. Bye. Bye, Thanks, everybody. Pam. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.